Okay. Recordings up. Uh, we're recording. We're live. Audio and videos up. So welcome to Structural Analysis. We are uh, definitely rocking and rolling. We're definitely moving along. Uh, there's a pun in there, and that'll become clear here in a bit. Um, let's talk about schedule because I want to. I want to. I'm going to be adjusting the schedule a bit on the exams, and I want to tell you why. Um, if you look at the syllabus, um, the syllabus shows that we're going to be doing the exam right before Thanksgiving break. And I actually don't think that's a good idea. Um, I, normally, I would do that, but um, obviously this semester is, is uh, well, it's, it's not, normal is not the word I, I would probably use to describe it with everything going on. Um, the reason that I would do the exam before uh, Thanksgiving break was, the exam would always cover the same topics. It would cover deflections and influence lines. Um, but because the homework is, is coming at you at a lot more rapid pace, I'm able to get the homework graded faster. Before, you know, I'd, I'd have a smaller number of assignments and they'd be bigger, so it'd take a little longer to grade. Um, I think, you know, if we're going to have a, a, an exam on deflections and influence lines, I figure it's probably better to do it sooner rather than later because the longer I wait to give you an exam on deflections, the longer it will have been since we've done the topic. So it sort of makes sense to do the exam sooner rather than later. But at the same token, I don't want to just spring an exam on you. Oh, we're going to have an exam on Monday. So I figure two weeks notice is, is a pretty reasonable compromise. And this really isn't moving the exam that far up. We're only doing it about a week earlier than we would have done it. Um, so we did um, RISA on Friday. Uh, and, and Risa on Wednesday, and we had finished deflections. So I want to start today as influence lines, and I want to spend the next five lectures on influence lines. Um, after that, I want to go ahead and do our exam review and have our uh, second exam, so that from on everything is just final land. Which is, I really have two topics I want to cover. Uh, final, I want to cover indeterminate analysis, and I want to do that between now between the second exam and. Uh, Thanksgiving break, and then when we come back from Thanksgiving break, I have a topic that's, um, I'd say, a lot easier, but very uh, much more practical, which is system loading. And the idea is, how do I take these, you know, lines with the triangles and the circles at the end of it, and you know, the distributed loads and point loads? How do I take that and apply it in real life? And so that's kind of what I want to cover during Dead Week, uh, that Monday and Wednesday, because it, it's a somewhat short topic, but it's really, really valuable. And so that's my vision, if you will, for the end of the semester. Um, so I figured this is a pretty reasonable compromise, and this this works well with the schedule. Everybody okay with this? Any questions before we uh, jump into influence lines? And yeah, I'll uh, I'll fix the um, the the typo that had said October on the. Um, uh, on the slide, and I'll I'll fix that uh, on the upload here in a bit. Everybody, good. Any questions? Is the audio coming through? I just want to make sure. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Um. So let's talk about influence lines. Uh, this is a topic that I've, um, uh, I've taken a, a little bit of care to ensure that, that the, the notes and what we do in class is pretty clear because this is always one that's maybe a tad confusing the first time that you, you see it. Uh, it's not that bad once you've got a bit of practice, but it's, it's a little bit of a different way of looking at structural analysis. And um, I want to begin by talking about the motivation. Like, why are we talking about this? So um, let's just sort of take a, a little bit of a step back and talk about structural analysis in general and what we've done between uh, the beginning of the semester and now. So, you know, one of the first things that we did at the beginning of the semester is we said, okay, let's learn how to classify structures. So is a structure determinate? Is it indeterminate? Is it unstable? You know, what have you. And really everything we've done uh, up until then has been focused, uh, everything past that has been focused on determinate structures. And when you're talking about structural analysis, really you're trying to answer two questions. What is the force response and what is the deflection response? So the force response was kind of what we focused on on exam one. You know, if it's a truss, what are the internal forces in the truss members? If it's a 
beam? You know, what's the shear diagram, moment diagram, what are the reactions, all of that. And then the deflection response is if I take load and I put it on a structure, it deforms. Okay. Um, understanding that relationship between loads and displacements is critical to performing indeterminate analysis. Um, and so we could actually start indeterminate analysis right now. Um, but there's one little problem we haven't talked about, and that's moving loads. See, up until now, everything, every problem that we've dealt with has been problems that have, where the loads are stationary. Right? I give you a beam, there's some loads on it, analyze it. And if I asked you for the shear and moment diagram or the deflections, you know, so on and so forth, you could do it. But then what happens when I take the loads and I move them? Or I say, okay, now here's the same beam, but it's a whole new different set of loads. Now you have to do the problem again. I have to compute the reactions again, draw the shear diagram again, draw the moment diagram again, compute the deflections again. As soon as I start changing the loads, it becomes an entirely different structural analysis problem. Um, and, and the thing about that is we deal with that in real life. Um, keep in mind, I mean, what, what type of structure do structural engineers deal with that is subjected to loads that move? Bridges. Bridges deal uh, experience moving loads all the time. In fact, you, without the, the tool that we're going to talk about, which is influence lines, without influence lines, you really can't properly design highway bridges. That, this, is, this is really the main motivation. Um, if I take a structure and I move the loads, it becomes an entirely different problem. So it sort of raises two questions. Okay, The first question is, can we develop a tool that will help us analyze structures that are subjected to loads that move? Uh, and the answer is yes. We have a name for that tool. We call it an influence line. Uh, but then the second question, the second follow-up question is, can this tool help us figure out the worst case scenario for load placement? So to keep that simple, if I have a um, a beam and I want to generate the worst possible moment, you know, where do I put the load? You know, it probably makes sense. I'd probably put it in the middle. If I want to generate the worst case shear, I'd probably put it near the ends and so on and so forth. Um, influence lines can help us determine that and they can also help us directly perform structural analysis. Now, what I've decided to do with the, the, the topic is this first week is only, you know, Today, Wednesday, and Friday is only going to be focused on just crafting the influence line, generating the influence line. And then next week, we'll talk about applying them. So we're going to take it one step at a time uh, with this topic. So first thing we need to do is we need to actually define an influence line. What is an influence line? Okay. So what is an influence line? An influence line is specifically, you know, it's, it's what I just said. It's, it's a diagram that we use to assess structures subjected to loads that move. But what does that mean? Okay, well, here's, here's the specifics of it. Okay, so the first thing that we do is we look at a, at, a, at a structure. Let's say I've got a beam here on the board or what have you. And I ask myself, okay, I'm interested in a particular point of response. What do I mean by point of response? Point of response could be uh, the reaction at a particular point. It could be the shear or moment at a given point. It could be the deflection at a point of interest, although we're really not going to on deflections, but you'll see how the, the theory would work. Um, but, but what you got to do is you got to have a structure and you have to pick a point that you're interested in. So um, let's, you know, for our first example, we're going to talk about a support reaction. Okay. Um, once you pick that point of interest, what you're going to do is you're going to take a unit load and you're going to move it across the structure uh, and you're going to record that response uh, at your point of interest as the load is moved. And the easiest way to um, uh, the easiest way to go through this is, is to do a really basic example. But before I dig into this, I do want to mention something. I have this gray box, and this gray box is really important. We're going to be developing some shortcut uh, means of, tra of crafting influence lines. And those, in, those shortcuts, uh, which there's a name for that shortcut, it's called the mueller breslau principle. That shortcut is going to make this job incredibly easier. But if you're ever having any, any questions or doubts about your influence line, you can always go back to this method. Okay? So I want to go through a very basic example with you. So let me stop the share here, and I want to talk a little bit about what I got here on the screen. Okay? So I have a beam. Uh, it's simply supported, and I have here that the beam is 80 foot long. Now, to be clear, it, the beam could be 80 foot long. It could be uh, uh, 100 foot long. It could be 60 foot long. It really doesn't matter how long the beam is for this particular problem. 
problem. But 80 is a nice uh, round number for, for our discussions. Uh, and let me sort of walk you through kind of the idea of what's going on here. So I'm going to need chat to help me out with this. So so let's let's start off with a pretty basic problem. Okay, let's say that I have a load right here at mid-span. Okay, so I've got a load applied right here at mid-span, right in the middle of the beam. And let's say that that load is 50 kips. Okay, somebody help me out. If I put the load directly at mid-span, what is the reaction today? Somebody help me out with that. 25 kips. This is exactly right. Now, um, what? It, that's exactly right. And an easy way of doing that is to say, well, AY is one half times 50 kips. That's exactly right. Okay. Now, um, let's let's go back to my original pro or statement. What happens if I take the loads and I change them or I move them? Okay. So now I'm going to ask you a different question. What if instead of 50 kips. Let's make this a new number. Let's say it's 26 kips. Okay, so now let's say it's 26 kips. What's the reaction at AY? It's 13 kips. 13 kips. Exactly right. And so for that one, what you're doing is you're taking a half times 26 kips. So let's let's think this through. Um, regardless of what the magnitude of this load is, if I want the reaction at A, I multiply this load by one half. Okay? I propose that there's something special about that number one half. Okay? Here, here's what I mean. If I were to change this to, let's just say, a unit load, like 1.0, and the reason why I'm using one is because anything times one uh, is itself. So you know, maybe make that point bigger so it shows up on the camera. If I put a unit load there of one, then the reaction at A is one half, okay? In order to craft an influence line, what I do is I take this unit load, this one, you can think of it as one kip or one kilonewton, whatever, take this unit load and move it across the structure. And as I move it across the structure, record the response. And so this region right here, this is going to be where I craft my influence line, okay? So I propose that if I have a one right in the middle, the reaction is a half. So if this is a plot, I'm going to put one half right here, okay? Now, let's let's add some more to this, okay? Let, let's, let's go back to the original definition of an influence line, and let's move the load. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this load, and I'm going to move it, okay? Now let's take the load and let's put it right here. Let's call this 1.0. So let me ask you a question. If I have a unit load, a 1.0 load right here, what is the reaction at A? It's 1. Exactly right. So this is 1. Okay. Now going back to my original question, let, let's do this, okay? What if... This was 50 kips, okay? If this was 50 kips, then the reaction at A would be 50 kips. And how would you do that? 50 times 1. What if this was 26 kips? How would you do that? How would you get the reaction at A? 26 times 1. Make sense? All right. If you're okay with that, let, let the other extreme. Now let's take the load and let's move it over here. If I put a unit load right here, again, always keep your eye fixed on the point of interest. The point of interest is the reaction at A. If I put the load here, what's the reaction at A? Zero, exactly right. So, Imagine if I kept doing this, if I picked all sorts of points across the structure and I just kept doing it. I propose then that I would get a plot that might look something like this. This is the influence line for the reaction at A. Okay? And there's a lot of very powerful information packed into this influence line. Number one, it tells us what the influence, what the reaction 
to A is regardless of where the load is. I can put a load anywhere on this beam and it will tell me what the reaction at A is. It also tells me something else. Let's say I have a load that moves. Where should I put the load to generate the worst case reaction at A? If I have a, if I have a beam here and I'm trying to determine the worst case reaction at A, let's say I'm the geotechnical engineer and this is a bridge and I need to design this abutment. Where do I put the load to generate the worst case reaction at A? I put it all the way over at A, right? And how do I know that? I'm getting the highest values here at A. Right, here's the influence line. The highest values are over here at A. Does that make sense? All right. So going back to the slides here, here's here's my uh, my my introductory example. So we've got a beam here, and we're going to construct the influence line for the reaction at A, and we just keep moving this unit load across the structure. And again, the idea is if I know the response due to a unit load, I know the response due to a 26 kip load or a 50 kip load or whatever. It could be any any magnitude of load. I just take the value on the influence line multiplied by the associated uh, uh, by the load. You know, the, the value on the influence line times the load. So here's what I get for the influence line for the reaction today. And that's our first influence line. For a simply supported beam, if you want to determine the leftmost reaction, that's the influence line. Okay. So what you're going to find is so, so let's go through some of the observations. I want to go through what's on this slide uh, in very fine detail. Okay. So while the load moves, you're going to discover one. The reaction is higher when the load is closest to A. That should just make sense. I don't know what's going on with the text here. I might have to check that. It looks a little weird. Um, AY is one when the load is at A, and AY is zero when the load is at B. Okay. Another thing that you're going to find is that the distribution is linear. Okay. There's a reason we call them influence lines, uh, and and what you'll find is for statically determinate structures, influence lines are always lines. They are linear every time. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask chat this, and I understand it might be a bit difficult to do this in chat, but to test your understanding, here's the influence line for the reaction at A. What would the influence line for the reaction at B look like? Where I put my little rubber blue uh, display. Look like this, but yeah, it would just go that way. Exactly. Now, Mr. Enoch said y equals x. Um, I get the the the, uh, the sentiment, but the, the issue with that is the slope. Um, the y equals x would have a slope of 1, and I propose this line wouldn't have a slope of 1. The rise over run would be 1 over 80. So it would be 1 over 80x. I get what you're saying, but make sure you get your, your rise over run uh, aspect. Yeah, but but you're you're on the right track. But And, and what... Um, Mr. Riggs said and, and what Mr. Garrison said are essentially the same thing. Just take and mirror it, and the influence line for the reaction at B, I would look. Uh, hold on, what's going on with my pen here? It look like that. Exactly right. Okay, and so that would be the influence line for the reaction at B. Okay. All right. Now let's let's recognize a, a couple things. That process will always work. Okay, I can always take a load, move it across the structure, record a response. And as structures get more and more complicated, that is always a way of, of that's always something you can fall back on. I can always uh, record or uh, just put the load at a spot, record the reaction. Put a load at a spot, record the reaction, and just keep doing that. I, and that'll always work. Um, but there's a, it's a little tedious, okay? Now let's, let's, um, let's make a couple more observations, okay? Again, influence lines for statically determinate structures are always lines, okay? And I make that point very, very, I'm making it very clearly because I can't tell you how many times I've given homework problems and I've given exam problems, specifically on exams, and I'll say, okay, draw the influence line for this and it's a timed exam and I get that you're rushed and you're trying to follow the rules and it does and you're like I can't figure it out and so you start curving the influence line if you're curving the influence line for a statically determinate structure you're doing something wrong influence lines for statically determinate structures are always linear and I can kind of show you why that is the case here in a bit um, again there's a reason they're called influence lines 
Um, for indeterminate structures, that might not be the case. For an indeterminate structure, you might have nonlinearity, uh, but I might show you that sometime next week. Um, uh, there is a way that we can uh, prove that they're lines, um, and maybe, but really the more specific question I want to ask is, is there an approach that we can develop to draw influence lines for any structure? Is there a more elegant, straightforward approach that's a lot faster? The answer is yes, and we have a name for that approach, and we call it the Mueller-Breslau principle, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the Mueller-Breslau principle and what it means, okay? The Mueller-Breslau principle is a graphical approach to drawing influence lines, basically, in a nutshell. So if you remember when we did shear and moment diagrams, you, know, you could always just move the point and record the shear and moment, move the, or, or move your point of interest, record the shear and moment, move the point of interest, record a shear and moment, or record the shear moment, and just plot that. And that'll work, but that takes forever. If there's a, a graphical approach that you can develop, it's going to be a lot more, um, a lot more straightforward. The Mueller-Breslau principle is that towards influence lines. Um, I'm glad you said that, Mr. Enoch, because I've got a few observations that are that we're going to look at here in a second that are geared to just towards that. Uh, that's that's an that's an excellent observation, and I'm going to add to that here in a bit. Right. Let's talk about Mueller-Breslau. Okay, Mueller-Breslau states that the uh, deflected shape of a structure represents to some scale, the influence line for the force effect if the quantity in question is moved through a small displacement. And I know that's a mouthful, so let's let's take it one step at a time. So here's how it works, okay? Let's say you have a, a beam and you wanna draw the influence line for the reaction today. Here's what you do, okay? You identify the, res the point of interest. So are you drawing the influence line for the reaction today? Are you drawing it for the shearing moment at a given point? What happened? Today, we're just going to focus on reactions. So we're going to identify a reaction that we're interested in. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to remove from the structure the ability to resist that response. So we're going to, you know, imagine a beam and you're trying to draw the reaction. You're going to kick that reaction out of the beam. Think to yourself, if I were to, you know, uh, 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 you know, this is Sparta. Kick the the reaction out. What what would happen to the beam? Okay, if I do that, you know, the beam's probably going to fall down. I then take the structure and I move it through a unit deformation at that point. And whatever the structure looks like, that is the influence line. Let me show you how that works in real time. Okay, so here's a beam, right? Okay, so let's say this, you know, wood, you know, uh, stick or whatever represents the beam. Okay, so let's say I'm drawing the influence line for the reaction at A. Okay, so here's what you do. There's a support at A. So I remove that support, okay? So imagine this, here's the beam and the beam is supported you know, by both of my fingers right here. This is the reaction at A, and this is the reaction at B. And then I remove from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at A. Now what would happen to the structure? It would just sort of fall down like that, right? It undergoes just a rigid body movement. It lapses, okay? But then what do I do is I take that and I move it through a unit display. I move it up one. What does the structure look like? It looks like the influence line, okay? So if I take the structure, remove that reaction at A, then move it through a displacement, that resulting displaced shape is the influence line. Likewise, what about the reaction at B? What if I removed from the structure the ability to resist the reaction at B and then moved it through a displacement? Well, the beam would stay here and it would move up. And that would be the reaction or the influence line for the reaction at B. So if you if you understand that, you can use that technique to assess far more complicated uh, uh, structures. But, but I want to make sure that just a simple case is clear because I want to, because before we start making things complicated, we need to handle the simple stuff. Does the idea of, you know, removing the, the support and then deflecting the structure, does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on that? Because I'm going to take that and I'm going to ramp up, you know, some of the, the complications or not really complications, but I'm going to make the structures a bit more intricate. Now, like I said, you can take this uh, approach and you can apply it to problems 
that are far more complicated. Um, but before we, we get into complicated problems, I want to build on what Mr. Enot said. And I want to um, see if we can develop some rules that even if the influence, even if the um, mueller Breslau principle is new to you and you're still trying to figure some things out with it, that there are some things that you can, um, there are some observations that you can make that will, will make your life a, a little easier when constructing them. So Mr. Enot uh, had a, a, a statement. He said, influence lines will always be non-zero uh, at the reactions of interest. I have a, a little bit of a different way of stating that, and that's this right here. Influence lines will always equal one at the reaction of interest, and they'll always equal zero at all other reactions. And I should state that this is only influence lines for reactions. When we draw influence lines for shear and influence lines for moment, these rules might not hold up, uh, but but you'll you'll see what I'm getting at here in a second. So, for instance, um, if you look at um, if you look at these influence lines that you see here on the screen. I've got the influence line for the reaction at A, the reaction at B, and the reaction at C. When you put the load, let's say, right here, um, what you find um, is this is one, but these are zero, okay? When you put the load right here at B, you find that this is one and this is zero, okay? When you put the load at C, you find this is zero, this is zero, and this is one. Because if the load is directly on C, then the reaction at C is going to be one. Everything else is going to be zero. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. Second point is that they're always linear. Okay. They're always lines. Okay. Uh, and again, as for proving it, it goes back to what I was saying here. That if you have a, uh, what I was saying here on the board, if you had, let's say, a simply supported structure and you removed a support, that structure becomes unstable. That structure doesn't form. It doesn't bend. Okay. Instead, what happens is that the structure just, just rigidly moves. Okay. And if the structure rigidly moves, it's going to rigidly move as a straight line. So influence lines are always linear for determinate structures, okay? So it, you know, you're gonna use to determine the values along linear paths. And we'll you know, example on that here in a bit. Third path, a third point. The internal hinges always serve to change the slope of the influence line. And, and I have a, a rudimentary but pretty basic uh, demonstration of that. So uh, this is my uh, a super scientific uh, demonstration. I have two sheets of paper and they're connected by a little pin here in the middle. So this is good, sort of acting as my hinge. Okay. So if I take this structure and let's say I move it through a displacement, let's say I move it like over here. Okay. If I take this point and I move it through a displacement, this goes up like that. And you can see that the influence line has changed slope. And that's always going to be the case for a hinge. Like let's say I have the point, let's say you know, my two, oh, goodness, lost my, my pen there. Um, hold on. Quit my malfunction. Okay, so let's say here's my beam, and let's say my two thumbs here, my two hands, these are the supports, okay? If I take this end over here and move it up one, it's going to move maybe something like that. And so this end's going to go up, but my thumbs are going to remain fixed. So the hinge is going to serve as a as a point where the slope changes on the influence line. Same thing happens here on these influence lines uh, that you see on the slide. Uh, you, know, you take point A. So imagine what happens here, right? Let's let's draw one out. Um, you take point A and you lift it up, right? But point B and point C remain fixed. So whatever my influence line is, it has to go through zero, right? And so I keep going. There's a hinge. The hinge causes it to change direction, and that's the influence line for the reaction at A. That trick will work every time, I promise. And the easiest way to explore that is to do some examples. 
Okay. But before I, I get into the examples, are there any like conceptual questions? Because don't worry, we got we got a lot of examples we're gonna we're gonna check through. All right. Now I want to show you what, what we're going to do here. Okay. So I'll do examples for you. I've got uh, this overhanging beam that you see here on the slide. We're going to draw the influence line for the two reactions. And, and to be clear, again, today we're only focusing on reactions. Um, tomorrow or Wednesday, we're going to focus on shears and moments. And then on Friday, we're going to look at cantilevered supports or fixed supports. And then we're going to look at trusses. Um, but today we're just going to take it one step at a time and just look at reactions. I'm going to draw the influence line for the reaction at A and the reaction at C. And then the next problem looks a little, there's a little bit more going on. Uh, we're going to do something similar uh, just with the reactions. Now, I'm calling these uh, examples like 1A and 2A because on Wednesday, we're going to come back to these problems and we're going to do 1B and 2B. We're going to say, okay, let's draw the shear and moment uh, influence lines at B. Let's draw the shear and moment influence lines at these sections, which by the way, a point, you know, a point or a section, it, it's the same thing. It's just a different way of naming it. Everybody good? Let me stop the share. All right, let's see if this pulls up. Okay. All right. Uh, are you talking about the second problem? The answer is yes. Like this problem here, there, well, there's a hinge here on this uh, second problem, but not on the first problem. The first problem, there's no hinges anywhere. So that's actually a, a key point I want to make here. In this first problem, Which, which example? Hold on, are you talking about just the Simply Support? You might need to turn your mic on. I'm, I'm. Yeah, I was just talking about how it seemed arbitrary to specify the distance between A and B and B and C. If there's no hinge there, it would become oh, confusing. That, that's a great question. Okay, there's, there's two reasons why B is specified right here. OK, the first the first reason is I want to make sure that we're comfortable with just the slope ratios just to determine what the value is at B. But again, we're going to come back to this example. So today, so, so just to be clear, today we're going to draw uh, two influence lines, one for a Y and one for a C Y. But on Wednesday, we're going to take this same beam and say, What's the influence line for the shear at B? And what's the influence line for the moment at B? Today, you are exactly correct. It is arbitrary. It's not going to be arbitrary on Wednesday. Yeah, you're exactly right. There's, there's nothing that, that B term doesn't really mean much today. You're exactly right. All right. Any other questions? All right, so let's reason through this, uh, this first problem, okay? So we have the influence line for the reaction at A, okay? So what do I know about the theory of influence lines, okay? I better get a, a one here, I better get a one at A, and I better get a zero at C. So this, this term here better be a zero, okay? I know that. I also know it has to be a line. The influence line has to be a line. This is a determinate structure, right? It's not indeterminate. And uh, there are no internal hinges, as Mr. Enoch pointed out. He's exactly right. So what does the influence line look like for uh, the reaction at, at A? It's going to look like that. That's the influence line for the reaction at A. 
Again, it's a one here at the uh, at A. It's a zero at all other reactions. It's linear and there are no internal hinges. So it's just a single straight line. Now, just to make sure that we're comfortable with some of our uh, uh, um, math here, does somebody know what is the value of the influence line right here? Can somebody tell me based on what the picture looks like? Let's just take point B first. If, if this makes the same as D, you're, you're exactly right, other than the sign change, uh, that one's going to be positive and one's going to be negative. But you're right that the magnitude is going to be the same because both of these distances are 10 feet. If both of those distances are 10 feet, then we're going to get the same uh, magnitude. But I, I'm talking about the value. Now keep in mind, this is a line. Okay, so let me ask you this. What is this distance right here? What's that distance? 30 feet. 30 feet. This is, so we, so rise over run, we rise one in 30 feet. So if we're trying to figure out what's going on at B, that's a, uh, over a run of 10 feet. So that value at B, and I'm just doing that, uh, is a third. And you're exactly right. That's a third. And so if that's a third, that means that this is minus one third, okay? And I wanna make sure that conceptually, we all understand what this means. What this means is if I have this beam and I put a, a load right there, and this is a hinge and this is a roller, and this dimension is 30 feet and this dimension is 10 feet, Okay, what that means right there is that I'm going to get a downward reaction of a third. That's what the statics means. And if you don't believe me, solve the reactions for this beam, and you'll get that the reaction at A is a third downwards every time. When the load is at D, when I have a unit load at D, I have a one-third reaction going down at A. Does that make sense? You don't understand that. Okay. All right. Let's walk through it. This is fine. Wouldn't it be one? Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Give me a second. All right. So here's the here's the beam. Let's put a, a load right there, okay? So this is at D, right? What's the reaction here and what's the reaction here, okay? So let's solve all the reactions, okay? This is 30 feet, this is 10 feet. Okay, this is A and this is C, right? So let's start off from basics. Let's sum moments at A. All right? So if I sum moments at A, what do I get? I get 1 times 40, and I get CY times 30. So 40 is CY times 30. So I get CY is 4 thirds up. Right? And if I sum forces in the y direction, I got one going down, but the way I have this drawn, I've got AY going up and I've got C, which is four thirds. So AY plus four thirds is one. AY is minus one third. What I'm saying is when the load is at D, the reaction at A is one thirds down. Reaction at C is four thirds up. We haven't done the influence line for the reaction at C yet. 
Let's take a second. Does this make sense? So the reaction, the value for the reaction at A is just whatever the the core sign, the, the, the corresponding value on the other side of the beam is. I'm saying, I'm, okay, here's what I'm saying, okay. All right. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. See this one-thirds right here, this negative one-third? I'm saying when you put, let's go back to the original beam. When you put a unit load here, you get a downward reaction here of a third. And that's what that one-third is plotting. We're looking at the influence line for the reaction at A. It is plotting the reaction at A as the load moves. When the load is at D, the reaction at A is minus one third. That's what the influence line means. Okay, okay, I got it. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, I was, what, what about Mr. Gar what about and what about Mr. Garrison too? Okay, so follow with me for a second. All right. So now let's draw the influence line for the reaction at C, okay? And so what do I know, okay? This point has to be zero, okay? If I put the load, let's go back to the original structure. If I put the load at A, if I put the load right here, there is no reaction at C. So this has to be zero, okay? What about at C? This has to be one. Okay, and so I need a straight line that connects those. This is the influence line for the reaction at C. Okay, now let's see if everybody's paying attention. What is that value? Just on the influence line. Two thirds. How about this value? Four thirds. Exactly right. Exactly right. These are the influence lines. And that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. I'm going to make an observation at the very end of the lecture that's going to blow your minds. But for now, I want to move on to the next problem because we don't have a lot of time and I really want to give the next problem it's it's uh, uh, respect under the sun. Let's let's move on to the next. One. I'm going to come back to this one. Don't worry. Next one. This next one is got a little bit more going on. Okay. Now I've drawn this section one one. You can kind of ignore that for now, just as we ignored the point B on the last problem, uh, because uh, we're going to come back to this section one one later. Now this right here, this is a hinge. OK, so that is going to change the uh, uh, the direction of the influence line. OK, over here, there isn't one. All right, so let's start off with the influence line for AY. So what do I know about the influence line? OK, it's got to be zero here. It's got to be zero here. And it has to be one here. Now, think about what happens when I take this point A and lift it up. Remember my little display that I had, the little pieces of paper connected with the pen? Think of what, what's going to happen at this hinge. I'm going to rotate this section about that hinge. I'm just going to rotate that up. What does the influence line for the reaction at A look like? It looks like that. In other words, if I put a load anywhere here, I do not get a reaction at A. If you don't believe me, just put a load there and compute reactions. You will get the reaction is zero at A every time. Now let me let me walk through the others, and again, I think you'll find this is a, this is pretty slick. Um, let's do let's mix it up a bit. Let's do um, give me one second. Do the reaction at C. I'm gonna just put 
put this right here. Let's do the reaction at C. So let's do the influence line for CY. Okay, so what do I know about the influence line for CY, right? This has to be zero. This has to be zero. And this has to be one. Right, if I put the load directly over C, okay, if I put the load directly over C, I'm going to get a reaction at C of one. And if I put the load on any of the other supports, I'm not going to get any reaction at C, okay? That's the first thing I know. Second thing I know, straight lines, no curves. What's the third thing I know? The hinge serves to change the slope of the line. So what does it look like? Just like that, change a slope, looks like that. That's the influence line for the reaction at C. We're gonna find some, let's, let's find some values here on this. Let's look here and let's look here. Let's see if we can find some values, right? Let me ask you this, what is this dimension here? Somebody help me out, what's that dimension? Twenty feet, and so in twenty feet I rise one. So what's this rise here? What is that? What is this value right there? Anybody see it? Point 0.7, you're exactly right. It's 14 over 20, 0 0.7. So if I put a unit load right there, I get a reaction at C of 0 0.7. All right, let me do the next one, and then I want to make this observation I think it's going to blow your mind. Oh, goodness, making, I'm trying to clean this up here a bit. One last one here. I'll go ahead and do this one for you. Well, you know what? I'm not going to do this one. Can anybody tell me what is that point? What is this point right here? I want to see if y'all are paying attention. It's not point 0.6. It's what Mr. Wise said. It's, uh, it's point 0.4, okay? Because we're going off of the longer line here, right? We don't know the slope of that line. We have no idea what the slope of this line is. But this line, we know the slope is you know, rise over run of 120. And so that one we do know. What um, what Mr. Uh, uh, Wise said was absolutely correct. It's minus 8 over 20, 0 0.4. That's exactly right. Does that make sense? Okay, now. Let me show you the, the very last one, and then I got to show you this point that's going to blow your mind. Okay. So, this last one here, zero, got to be one, got to be zero. This is the influence line for BY. And remember, the hinge is where the slope changes. So, what does it look like? It looks like that, and then change in slope, looks like that. Now, if you're having a hard time figuring out the points on these lines, I'm going to show you something that's going to blow your mind. Go back to this first problem. What do you get when you add up those two numbers? You get one. What do you get when you add up these two numbers? You get one. What do you get when you add up these two numbers? You get one. What do you get when you add up these two numbers? You get one. Because the vertical load that you're applying downward is one. 
reactions have to add up to be positive one for sum of forces in the y direction to be zero. So every value on the influence line for your reactions, if you take all of your reaction influence lines and you add them up, they have to be one. So when you go back here and you're like, hold on, I'm having a hard time figuring out what's going on. Let me zoom out a bit. This value right here, that value has to be 0 0.3. Why 0 0.3? Because if you add up that value, that value, and that value, it has to be 1. This plus this plus this equals 1. This plus this plus this equals 1. That plus that plus that equals 1. This plus this plus this equals one. So the question becomes, what's that? 1.4, because the one below it is minus 0.4. So when you add up and superimpose all of the influence lines, they all have to equal one at every point along the influence line because of some of verticals, some forces in the y direction. Is that a marker drop moment? Pretty slick, isn't it? And the beauty of this technique is while these influence lines look like just arbitrary points, I can determine the reaction at, on this beam. <laughs> I can determine the reactions on this beam due to any load anywhere because of these influence lines, okay? I know the, re the reactions due to a unit load, so I know the reactions due to any load, okay? So it's a different way of approaching structural analysis. We're gonna apply this stuff to determining reactions and things like that next week. For now, I just want you to practice this, the construction, that's all. So on this homework assignment, I've given you two problems where I want you to draw the influence lines just for the reactions, okay? Don't do shear, don't do moment. We haven't figured that out yet. That's Wednesday. For today and for your homework, just the reaction influence lines. All right, any quick questions before we call it? All right, I'm going to go ahead and call it again. Um, practice this out, you know, you know, try it out. Uh, if you have any questions, rewatch the video. I think you're going to find this is a pretty valuable uh, a technique for analysis. But that's all I have, everybody. I will see you all on Wednesday. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you then.